Last time on Compelled. And it was just like it all came crashing in on me. I was just really deeply convicted, like, I wanted a baby. But what if God didn't want me to have one? And that really affected me deeply. The thing that really stood out in my mind was adoption. That maybe God was orchestrating all the pieces of our life, because that's what he wanted. Each of my children, I could look at as, with Griffin, it was like, this is submission. And then with Reese, I look at him and I just think, this is faith. And we would joke and we would say, well, unless God wanted to drop $20,000 into our lap, I guess our family is complete. And we were totally happy with that. But then one day he did. <laughs> so we had at the very beginning committed to two years and $20,000 that we would give all back to God. I'm Paul Hastings, and you're listening to Compelled, real people telling true stories about God's compelling love working in their lives. Today, we're wrapping up a two-part story with our guests, Rob and Heidi Fuller. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to the first part, we'd encourage you to find it at our website, compelledpodcast.com. During our last episode, we heard how Rob and Heidi saw God providentially make a way for them to adopt two children. Then out of nowhere, they received $20,000. And after much prayer, they decided to put it toward one more adoption. They expected this adoption process to resemble the miraculous nature of their prior adoptions. But instead, Rob and Heidi were about to enter one of the darkest, most difficult seasons of their lives. We very quickly learned how differently this process was going to be. Mm -hmm. Within the first couple of weeks, we did get a phone call. Um, a phone call or an email, and it just said, there's a baby in Utah, a baby girl. Um, she's available for adoption. Are you interested? And I immediately replied back and said, yep. And I just assumed that's what God had. See, look what happened. I knew he was going to do this, you know? So I immediately replied back that, yes, that one's ours. And I picked up the phone and I called my dad. And I remember I said, dad, we have a little girl. Her name's Mariah Grace. And I remember that was the name we had given to her. And I said, and her birthday is... I gave him the birthday. He entered it in the family calendar. And I started looking at hotels in Utah, you know, to go pick her up. And the next morning, we realized I wasn't the only one they'd sent that hmm. message to. Hmm. And it was like, it's the way it had happened before. But this wasn't the way it was going to be this time. Yeah. They were going to contact me every single time somebody was available. So I was disappointed. But I, it was like a wake-up call. Oh, Oh, like you weren't just talking to me. Oh, you were like talking to other people too. Okay, so I was sad, but it wasn't devastating. It was just a reality check. Well, a couple more weeks went by, got another phone call. It just, it would be a process like that. It was Thanksgiving time. We got actually matched with a baby. A birth mom chose us, saw our profile, picked us. She was still pregnant. Um, that one fell through. Mm. So that was a little bit more traumatic, feeling like, okay, we were actually chosen. And so before the first four months were up, we had had four situations mm. already like slipped through our fingers. That, that to some level, you know, our heart had, had gotten into them yeah. some way. Yeah. And, and that's the hard thing for adoptive couples who are going through this process is that, that when you get a call about a baby that is available, even if it's just really early in the process and they haven't even chosen you yet, you start to have your heart set on this little child. And then when they fall through or you're not chosen or uh, the, the option is taken away from you, it is just absolutely heart-wrenching. And uh, with, with adoption, especially adoptive couples, that happens over and over the new year came and I remember thinking, okay, 2012, this is the year. This is the year it's going to happen, right? <laughs> we knew it was going to happen that year, but we would, we just kept getting calls. In May, we got a call about a little girl down in Texas had been born very, very prematurely. And I remember with her, there were only two of us that had decided... Two families. Two families um, that had decided to stick with that one. Yeah. Everyone else had walked away because they said, she's way too fragile. And they came back to when they, us and they said, well, she picked the other family. And I don't know what it was about that, but I remember this feeling of such rejection. Yeah. <laughs> Just feeling like, you mean I can't even get picked out of a lineup of two families? Well, during that summer... 
um, I started having some bleeding issues and some health issues and I just was not feeling right. And I never went to the doctor, but I said, I'm going to call the doctor because I think I need to go see him. Something's going on. And in my logical mind, I thought that doctor is going to take a pregnancy test. When I get there, that's going to be a standard thing they're going to do for every female that comes in here. They're going to issue a pregnancy test. So I might as well just do it now and tell them you don't even, you can rule that out. (laughs) I'm not pregnant. But that time when I took the pregnancy test, it was positive. Wow. And I was shocked. 10 years of marriage is the last thing that we expected. First time you saw the plus sign. First time I had ever seen a plus sign. And I just remember thinking, that's why God closed all these other doors. He closed these five other adoptions because he had this. So I go to the doctor to get my blood tested. And they said, sure enough, you're pregnant. Well, we're going to have you come back in two more days for this this week, I'm I'm just on cloud nine. I can't believe God has given me the one thing I gave up after I submitted all this to him. You know, now all this money we actually get to go on vacation with. And what a good God, you know? Well, two days later, I get a phone call from the nurse who took the second uh, set of, of blood. And in the most nonchalant way, she called me on the phone and just said, your tests reveal a miscarriage. You should experience that very shortly. Oh. And that was it. She just hung up. And I, I just collapsed on my bathroom floor because I thought that was the meanest thing that God could ever do to me. Mm. I could not picture a more cruel, vicious thing that he could do than to play with that part of my life. Yeah. And everything within me, I just, I remember laying on the bathroom floor screaming at God And all I said was, how could you? How could you? Just over and over and over. I was so, so angry at him. It was just a a terrible time for her. And what I was going through was, God, I don't, I don't know how to help my wife. You know, I'm, I'm a, a counselor. I do marriage counseling and addictions counseling and all sorts of counseling at the church. I have a master's degree in biblical counseling. And I was sitting there and I didn't know how to help my wife. I didn't know how to restore her faith in a good God. Besides just saying God is good, it says so in Scripture. I mean, I I was I felt bankrupt um, to to help her, and it was it was just very very trying. And I was at such a low place, and I remember coming to a point. You know, you'd you'd get to this really 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 dark valley, and then you'd start to kind of come out, and you'd start to say, "Okay, God." You can do it again. You could still do something good here. And I'd kind of start to get to this place of faith. And then it would just happen again. We'd get another call, but another adoption would fall through. And so I remember coming to a place where during that time period, you know, all the moms my age are having kids. They're all having kids. So you're not able to remove yourself from it. You go to a church function, they're all there. Everyone's got a baby and they're all talking about them or their pregnancy experience. And so I, I wasn't able to escape even when I'm trying to come out of this pit, you know? And so I remember during that time crying out to God and just saying, God, I know you can bring me out of this, but if you choose that this valley is what you have for me, I plead with you, just give me a friend to walk it with me. Just one friend. If you give that to me, if you just let me have a friend to walk this journey, I will embrace it. I'll embrace it. Within weeks of starting to pray that, I got a call from Amy Bowman, who is our youth pastor's wife. And so we have a very close relationship with them. And we get to talking and she starts telling us that um, after a number of years dealing with infertility and after having a confirmation from the doctor that actually they'd never be able to have children, they were going to be adopting. And I was elated. Because I thought, God did it. He said, this is the path I have for you. But you know, I'm so gracious. I'm going to give you a friend. Just what you asked. I'm just going to give you that friend to walk it with you, who understands, who knows the right things to say, doesn't say all the stupid things to the adoptive mom, okay? Just one friend who gets it. So I was so excited. I was so, so excited. I'm planning in my mind, how am I going to make this easy for them? How am I going to plan their baby shower and everything that's going to happen for them? Well, wouldn't you know, a couple of weeks later, she came over. She dropped by my house on a weekday, and she said, Heidi, I wanted to come tell you in person, um, but I just found out I'm pregnant. And, and again, it, it wasn't that I wasn't happy for her and for her journey because I was, but it was just another thing in my long string of, of little treats God was dangling in front of my face only to take him away. Their only purpose was to take him away out of my life, you know? So he took, he took a pregnancy. He took the adoptions. He took the friend. He just kept doing this. And so right when I would think, maybe he's good, he would do it again. You know, he would, it would just happen again. 
well, it wasn't too much longer after that. Um, we had a situation where twin girls were being born in Nebraska. And through a variety of circumstances, we had been put in contact with them. Um, the birth mom uh, was not able to care for them. She wasn't married, and so she just had no way of supporting these girls. And so through a variety of circumstances, we got put in touch with them, and she was going to be considering us to adopt these girls. And so I remember feeling like even though I had just had this miscarriage and I had just dealt with all of this stuff, being really, really happy that, okay, well, two, that's awesome. That's like a double blessing. I mean, I was really, really happy about this. And um, the birth mom went into um, preterm labor very, very early. And the girls were born at um, only like one and a half pounds each. And then we get a phone call at five days and nine days after their birth that each one died. Oh. Two weeks after they, after they died, got another call. Baby girl had just been born down in Texas. She was already like four weeks old. Did we want her? Birth mom had chosen us. This was another official match. Would we go get her? And I remember by that point, my heart was so weary. It was like, whatever. You know, maybe this is the one God has. I don't know, but do I dare even get excited? And I remember sitting in church. Amy had just had her baby. We were sitting next to each other in church one Sunday, and the special music got up to sing. And they were singing a song based on a verse in Job that says he giveth and he taketh away. And I remember just sitting there and here I am next to Amy, who is clearly the epitome of he giveth. God had granted her this beautiful thing that she had longed for. And my whole year had been, he taketh away. That's all he had done is taken things away. And I was like, is this just like a lot in life? You're going to be, he taketh away and she's going to be, he giveth. And so I remember at the invitation of that service, I, I leaned over and I nudged her and I just said, can we go talk somewhere? And we got into Rob's office and I just unloaded. I mean, I like ugly cried for an hour and I just sobbed to her. And I, I said, I told her all about the situation in Texas and how we're going down there. And I just remember sobbing to her and saying, I want to be excited, but I don't know if I can trust God. I mean, he wouldn't take her too, would he? He wouldn't do it again. He wouldn't just keep doing this. Like it's got to end, right? It's got to stop. And it's not even like she knew what to say. She just sat there and cried with me. We would just sat in this room and cried together. And I just kept saying, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he would not do this to me again. He has to stop. So for Christmas, we didn't go to be with our family. We redecorated our house. We bought a crib. We bought a car seat. We bought some dresses. We went down to Texas, and we get to the hotel. Just after New Year. It, it took like an hour, and we got a phone call. And she's like, you know, Kelly, the birth mom's name was Kelly. She said, you know, I'm not sure what's going on with Kelly, but Kelly is asking for more money. And we said, what? You know, and it was just, yeah, she's saying she won't sign anything unless you give her some more money. <laughs> and so here we are. What do we do now? And in the end, we said, well, if you give us the baby, we'll give you a little bit more money. Long story short, we left Texas with a car full of baby gear for this little baby. And we had no baby. And it was just such a low, low place in life. Like everything I believe about this God Everything in my theology clashes with my reality. It does not match, and it's not ending. By then, it had been a year and a half of this. A year and a half of over and over and over and over. When's it going to end? Yeah. We knew what who God was. We knew what Scripture said. We'd even seen the evidence of it in our past, but our our reality just did not look like what our theology said. Yeah. So we get back from Texas and no baby and dealing with all of these emotions and things. And we'd been thinking uh, about other options. You know, we've been about a year and a half now working through the adoption side and maybe there's something different that we should do. Maybe we started thinking about uh, the uh, maybe doing in vitro. And one of the things that, that, I often go to in February, at the beginning of February, is the Biblical Counseling Training Conference in Lafayette, Indiana. And there is a, a certain uh, gentleman there who does some of the some of the teaching. He's an OBGYN. I knew that he would be a good resource for me to go and talk to him. Uh, so I was explaining what was going on. And he looked at me and, and he said, you know, Rob, um, have you ever considered 
embryo adoption? And I said, no. And he says, have you ever heard of it? No. And I looked at him like he was a crazy person because <laughs> uh, it sounded weird. And so I just kind of put it away. I, I, I did call my wife, though, because I was going to mention it to her, see if she'd ever heard of it or if it was as weird to her as I, I'd thought. So I called her while I was in Indiana, and I said, yeah, and he mentioned this thing about, about embryo adoption. And she goes, Rob, that is so strange. That is so funny because I was just talking to one of my piano students' moms, and she... They had she done, brought up the same thing. <laughs> she had done in vitro, and they'd frozen some of their embryos. And so she's got one daughter who's you know several years older than the other daughter, but they were they were embryos created at the same time. So you know it's this funny thing. And she goes, but she was telling me that some people don't use all their embryos and they give them up for adoption. And so that's exactly what he's talking. That's so strange that you were that he was saying that to you, and I was hearing about it as well. I was like, wow, that is kind of strange. You know, we just kind of let it go, but boy, some things like that don't leave your mind really fast. So yeah. we both started thinking on it, and when I got back from from uh, from the conference, like I had uh, mentioned before, my wife is a very driven person, and no grass grows under her feet, and she'd already been researching yeah. and looking into this whole thing. And boy, uh, we had we had a crash course in what uh, embryo adoption was. It was enough for us to say, okay, we need to ask a few questions. So I think what was most intriguing about that is so in our whole journey, we had always committed that God could have all $20,000 and he could have two years. Well, we were coming up on the end of that. So the end of that time period was fall. And we were now in February and everything is a process. So <laughs> we... We were calling the National Embryo Donation Center and asking our questions over the phone. And as I'm asking them about the cost of this, the lady tells me that for two transfers, we could we could get it done for about $9,000. Well, $9,000 was exactly what we had left in our savings account. And so on March 1st, we sent in our application. Well, wouldn't you know, six weeks later, they had a, an opening. And they said, if you guys can come, you can come for that appointment. It's like all of a sudden, God started opening doors. And so we went in July really with very excited hearts that this was what God had. And, and just to clarify, there's a whole medical process that oh, go, yes. that's involved where they're putting hormones in your body and yes. making your body thinking you're pregnant. And But we had gone through all that, and now we're at the day of transfer, and we're excited. You know, okay, here's what we've been working for, right? And they transfer the two, and they say they're very healthy, and so your odds are really good. And so... I remember 10 days. They're like the longest 10 days of your life, you know, <laughs> waiting for that first test where they tell you if you're pregnant or not pregnant. So I went in for that blood test and they called me that afternoon and they just said, I'm very sorry to inform you that, that you're not pregnant. Mm. Well, now we'd wasted 4,500 more dollars. I'd gone through six weeks of injections. I was, I was physically numb from all of the injection sites. I had, you know, black and blue marks. Mm. I was, it was a very wearing process. Not to mention your hormones are on a roller coaster. As I'm sitting on the bed crying about this and just saying, you know, God, why do you just keep doing this? When is it going to end? When is this process going to end? I just want it to be done. I just so want this whole thing to be done. You know, say no, just say no, we'll be done. <laughs> Let us move on with our life. And I'm telling God, I don't know anybody who understands me. I'm in such a unique place in life. No one knows me. And it's like in that instant, even though I'd heard the gospel from itty bitty, all of a sudden it's like God's whispering in my ear saying, Heidi, I know what it's like to lose a child. And it's like the gospel again became real. It became clear. Okay, God, you do. You get it. You know what it's like to lose a child. You lost Jesus Christ. You do. You know it. And that was very comforting during that time to come to this realization that even in those dark moments, God understands. Like he understands that pain. He has been there, you know? Well, here I'm ready to just so be done with this. I am so over this whole adoption process. I am sick and tired of it. But we had $4,500 left in this stupid savings account. And I'm thinking, I told God I was going to give it all to him. And if I am anything, I'm going to be honest about that. And I'm going to fulfill this commitment and be done and say, look, I gave it all back to you. You know, I'm just going to be done with this. And by that point, I don't think either of us expected a baby because we just thought, 
the point was never a baby. The point was our submission to this process. The point was to change us. Yep. It has that nothing. That was the process God wanted us on to allow Him to do something and and to let God uh, control all of that and and to see us submit. September rolled around, and it, she was telling me, "Rob, this month's going to be a tight month," and um, we hadn't told anybody about this process that we were going on, and. Um, <laughs> The weekend that we were going to leave, uh, this counselee, uh, these counselees were were in my office, and they, uh, he he gave me a card and said, "We just we just want to say thank you for what you're doing and the time you spent to help us." And um, I was, I got in my car, and you know I'm a curious person. I couldn't wait to open it to see uh, what this card was, and and so I I opened it up, and there was a gift card for a thousand dollars to to Walmart, and. Uh, I just I I had to stop the car. I didn't even make it out of the driveway, and I started crying and and uh, saying thank you, Lord, for just this incredible blessing. And I called Heidi and and mentioned it to her, even though we were only five minutes away from seeing each other. But I just had to call her and tell her, and she started crying and and thanking the Lord. And it was it was just a beautiful thing that God helped us with because it, her stress level just bottomed out. I mean, she mm. was at peace, calm. We're going to go and drive to Knoxville this time. And you know, you're supposed to keep it as low stress as possible. So the first time we didn't bring our kids, but this time we decided that we're going to bring our kids because we didn't think we could pay for a babysitter uh, at that point. So we we planned something. We'd gotten a real great deal on a hotel uh, in St. Louis on the way down. So we could do it. So we could do it in two days and uh, super cheap. And so we started, um, we started this this journey, and it was like you know what God's already provided. God's yeah. already provided. We can enjoy this, enjoy this time as a family. We don't know whether we're going to get a child or not. Doesn't matter. We're going to have fun because God has already created this great family, and He's provided for it. And so we on were September twenty fourth, yeah, it would we have been two thousand thirteen. Chilled out. So and, we went for the transfer number two. Yeah, and she, you know, we were just joking, and we met some cool people that we were talking to back there, and they say, "Okay, Heidi, we're ready to take you." And uh, we got these two two more embryos that 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 survived that we're going to implant, and so they start weaving her out, and I say, "Say hi to the kids for me." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, so she goes and, and gets the gets them implanted, and then. Um, I drive her back home after, or drive her back to the hotel. And you know the process after that transfer. I, I think I had just so completely resigned myself to it's not going to happen, and it wasn't meant to ever be. But now I'm done. Yep. And I was so happy about that. The money's gone. Home study's done. We're done with this nightmare of a two year journey. And so I didn't even care what the outcome was. I think we were just all so relieved to be through with it. Yeah. So 10 days later, I went in for the blood test and the nurse, Nurse Katie, called me on my cell phone that afternoon and I was in our bedroom and I answered the phone just thinking, you know, let's get this over with and move on with life. And she just said, hey, Heidi, is Rob there with you? And I said, okay, well, let me go get him. And I brought Rob in the room and put the phone on speakerphone. And she said, "Um, well, I called because I had a question for you guys. And I said, yeah, what's that? And she, she asked, well, is your house big enough for two more? And I was just shocked. I said, what? What did you say? And she said, well, when you go in for that first blood test, we're looking for an HCG level of 100. And that generally indicates a healthy pregnancy of one baby. And so she said, but yours came back at 452. 450. And she said, that is one of the highest I've ever seen. I am just so confident that yeah. both of those she little embryos have said, we can't ever tell for sure, but most of the time when this happens, there's more than one in there. I was shocked. It was the last outcome I expected because I, I really just didn't think that was the point. I was totally shocked. But I remember I went in for the six-week ultrasound because that's when they were going to be able to confirm what their theory was, that there were two babies growing in there. And so we went in for the six-week ultrasound, and I'm sitting on the exam table just quoting over and over Colossians 1, 16 through 18, where it talks about God creating everything. It's all created by him, and the purpose of all of it is that he would be preeminent. And so I'm saying this over and over in my mind, you know, do what you want, God. I know the purpose is that you be preeminent. And the doctor came in and he and Rob and I are sitting there holding hands and I have no clue what I'm looking at on the screen because it makes no sense to me. But he says, 
how many embryos did they implant? And we said two. And he says, well, I am looking at three perfectly healthy babies right here. Oh, wow. And we were And I were stood up. Shocked. I three. jumped up <laughs> and said, what? <laughs> and I, I looked and I, I leaned over the, the bed they had Heidi on and I, I was like, show me. And, and he was pointing out where they all were and I was just dumbfounded, just absolutely dumbfounded. And he I sat had no and words. listened to each heartbeat and sure enough, there were three perfectly beating hearts and it was truly the last thing we expected. It, it was pure joy. I mean, it was pure and complete joy because everything about what we were looking at was, this was it. This, this is, is the God Ephesians 3.20, exceeding abundant above all that you can ask or think. They were finally born at 31 weeks, and that is early. They were thir 31 and a half weeks um, gestation, and so there could have been so many things that could have gone wrong and so many things that have co could have consumed me with fear, and yet I look at that time, and I just did not have that. I didn't have any of those fears. It's like by that point, God had brought me through a two-year period and given me such confidence that I was in control of all of this, like I'm still in control now, you know, that I can honestly say I wasn't afraid of those things. I wasn't afraid of things going wrong. It wasn't a scary time for me. It was a time of great peace and great joy, actually, just every step of the way. I mean, God just dumped blessings on us left and right, and everything was just taken care of. They they came within about an hour and 15 minutes, and they just came, bam, 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 one minute apart, and it was just a miracle as they held up these perfect, precious little babies. They're just such wonderful uh, wonderful blessings. And uh, I think Tarek, uh, Tarek and Kira came home at uh, 18 days, I believe it was, and uh, Drake came home 10 days later at 28 and uh, just in time for the thing that Heidi was most praying for, she wanted those babies home by Mother's Day. And mm. uh, they came home the day before Mother's Day. And Mother's Day, she was able to walk in to church with her three little babies in the car seats. And uh, it was such a blessed day. Wow. What a blessing. Um, Heidi, I I'm curious, just for, um, you know, looking backwards in time, was there ever a point when, I, I guess, like, how do you justify, how do you, you know, look at those moments like when it felt like God was playing you along, mm -hmm. and then today, you now you have, you know, the triplets and, and you're in other those moments, he doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah. In those moments, he doesn't look good at all. Um, but looking back, you get little glimpses, you know, you get little glimpses into how he was orchestrating pieces of your life to accomplish something good. And, you know, through all of this, oh man, my, my outlook, my my outlook on salvation, my outlook on him, all of it is different. All of it. You know, he changed my desires. He changed all of that. There was a time I would have said adoption, never, never. And yet he, he used all these pieces to bring me to a place where I just so embrace it that I would never have wanted it any other way. You know, I say, this is so cool, so good that you used me to be part of your grace to a helpless little baby. Like, how cool is that, you know? So to just use those parts to change me, the embryo adoption piece, if I had not had the miscarriage, I'm not sure we ever would have considered it. Oh. We had so been thinking traditional adoption for so long um, that we just didn't know anything else existed. It was so wacky. It was so out there. But then that pregnancy piece was thrown in there, and I knew about it for two days, you know? It was just enough it seems to open our mind to that little extra level. And so I see little pieces like that where I think hmm. he was just using all of them to accomplish something good. The times when a baby that we were trying to adopt would fall through and would go home to a birth mom who's, who's not living a righteous life, and you're questioning, how are you good here? You know, to think how that has transformed my thinking, how that has given me a confidence and a trust in him, that, but you still are. You still are good there. It All of those pieces have bolstered my faith. So every one of them had a good purpose. I didn't see it then. I didn't see it then at all. But when you go through all of that and you come out on the other side, you can look back. And I know in heaven is where the veil is lifted and we see it. Um, so I know we just get little glimpses here. But I feel like I've gotten little glimpses into here's why. Yeah, Yeah, we've got five of them running around our house every day. Yeah, you know, I go through the house and I just think, you know, I just have like a physical representation of God's grace in my living room. 
Well, Rob and Heidi, it has been a blessing and a pleasure to just listen to you guys share your story and your testimony and the witness. And um, I know for me personally and for all those that are listening, I know it's just going to be a real blessing for all of them as well. well praise so, the Lord. Thanks, guys. And that concludes our two-part story on Rob and Heidi's amazing adoption journey. Rob and Heidi's story serves as an encouraging reminder of God's sovereignty, goodness, and faithfulness to his children, even in the midst of heartbreaking circumstances. Again, if you want to hear part one, you can find it at our website, compelledpodcast.com. Heidi wrote a beautiful song entitled, I Know, near the end of their adoption journey right after they lost the first two embryo implants. It's a beautiful song, and there's a professional recording of her and Rob singing it together. She's graciously agreed to give a free download of it to our listeners. So just head over to our website, compelledpodcast.com, search for this episode, and enter your email address to receive the free download. Also, during our interview, the Fuller shared that Heidi has been writing a book about their adoption experience that covers so much more than our podcast interview has been able to. So if you sign up for the free download, we'll make sure to let you know when the book is published. You can find other episodes of our podcast at our website or by subscribing to Compelled on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, and many other podcast platforms. New episodes are released every Tuesday. If you haven't already heard, we're over halfway done with our season. And if you've enjoyed our show, then we'd really appreciate it if you'd share it with some friends. One of the best ways is sharing an episode on Facebook and leaving a five-star rating on iTunes. Those are probably the two most effective ways to help new listeners find our show. Our show is edited by Zach Fowler, a gifted film editor, visual effects artist, and storyteller. You can find Zach and his work at ZachFowlerImagery.com. Our logo was designed by Josiah Jost, an incredibly talented logo designer. You can reach Josiah and view his work at SiahDesign.com. Our website was created by Ben Billups, a digital developer extraordinaire. You can follow Ben on Instagram at ben.billups. Our media intern is Frank Allegrea. You can find him on Twitter at the Frank Allegrea. Our assistant producer is none other than my lovely wife, Sarah Hastings. Without her, this podcast wouldn't exist. And that's it for this episode. Stick around after the music for a sneak peek at our next episode with Brent Hambrick, a physician with a promising career who did the unthinkable. He followed God's calling and moved his family of nine to a third world nation to deliver medical care and the gospel. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and you've been listening to Compelled. We'll see you next Tuesday. We would meet children that had clubfoot which is where your club inputs. And the mother came to me one time, I remember, and she said, you know, well, he's got a cold. And I was examining him. I said, well, you know, he's a newborn. He's got these club feet. Uh, what are you doing about that? And she said, you can do something about it. And wow. I told her, your child will run and play soccer like any other Honduran child. And she started to weep. She had no idea. She just lived out in the jungle. She thought that her kid was going to be crippled. And they're very open to the gospel, and you've extended such kindness to them.